السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله السلام عليكم السلام عليكم السلام عليكم السلام Okay, Jazakal Khair, Assalamu Alaikum, uh, our viewers and listeners. Uh, Alhamdulillah, this is our 14th episode and our fourth installment on the series. Fourth, yeah. It's fourth or yeah. fifth? Pretty sure it's fourth. The first one we had was with Brother Khulam Malik, then we had one with uh, Salah Sharif, Salah Sharif. And now we had, uh, then we had one with Murat, uh, uh, yeah. and now we have one today, inshallah, Muhammad with a very special guest, uh, Muhammad Arshad. I was going to say, you know, with Muhammad. Did you, did you usually you skip that name or did you say him? Arshad? No, everyone calls me Muhammad. Muhammad as yeah. well. Okay, because yeah. I was I have a group chat uh, of football for my masjid, yeah? You have 500 um, Muhammad. Yeah, so <laughs> someone, someone's, yeah. they're both, a few of them called Muhammad. Yeah. One of them identifies themselves as Muhammad. One of them identifies them with a second name. So I'm thinking maybe, you know. Yeah, Muhammad. He, okay. Everyone knows me. Asking. Alhamdulillah. And now, Muhammad Arshad is a very special guest. Um, and it's very interesting, his life, not just his, uh, his business experiences, but it's also his, his uh, volunteering expenses that he's had in the Muslim community. Uh, and that, inshallah ta'ala, will be all unwrapped and unraveled during the discussion, inshallah ta'ala. So first of all, I just want to start off with an icebreaker. Um, do you have any interesting stories for us today? Okay, before we do icebreaker, I want to I want to kind of like flip the script a little bit, right? All right okay. The first thing I want to do, actually, and this is like breaking your rules, I guess. No, no is, I love uh, I love it. I want I want to recognize both of you. That's that's what I want to start with. Um, okay. And the reason I want to recognize you guys because I I kind of learned a little bit about what you guys are trying to do here. Okay. Um, and I'm really really impressed. Right? Mm -hmm. And I want you to say this on camera because the reason why I'm impressed is because I'm always impressed by people who give for the sake of Allah and with yourselves you're actually giving for the sake of Allah right now because you're here to help other people grow and get better and impact their life, right? Mm. Something amazing that I learned is that what is the most rewarding thing someone can do in Islam? Uh, Are you allowed to talk about it on camera? <laughs> no, that's good. The <laughs> yeah? most rewarding so thing you can do. Someone dying in Islam, dying yeah. for the sake of Islam, would be considered very, very yeah. noble, yes. right? Yes, and that's like, a, that's like a, you know, do not uh, pass, go, just go all the way straight yeah. Yeah, and yeah. you're like, you're made, basically, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, now think about that. When someone actually does that, like they actually die for the sake of Allah or something happens and, you know, they sacrifice. Mm. What do they sacrifice? Their life. What is life? Their wealth, their family. What their, is life? What is their life? What is their, life? Their, their, their servitude to Allah. What is life, though? Well, what do you mean, like, life? What is life? <laughs> The purpose of life or? No, what is life? This is so, look, he's aware that we're yeah. the guests now. We're being interviewed. <laughs> I'm asking you, what is life? Uh, uh, I don't know, as in, uh, life is a series of moments and events. Okay, good, moments. Place. So what is a yeah. moment? A moment is something that happens, that takes place. What would we classify as? An experience. An experience, yeah. Uh, Your life is like you said, moments. Time. Moments yeah. are time. Uh, moments are time, yeah. Right? <coughs> so now we're saying that Someone who gives up their life is actually giving up time. Yeah. Right? So they, maybe they died at like, uh, you know, at 28 and they sacrificed, maybe they would have lived to 60. Yeah. So what's happened is that they made a sacrifice of their life, which mm. is the end of their life, but it's also a sacrifice of time. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So this sacrifice of time is recognized and rewarded by Allah on another level. Mm -hmm. right? And so what I do is always tell brothers like yourself who are out there giving that in essence, you guys are giving time as well. Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so yeah. you being here, you coming here, you being here for the sake of the people and helping them, this is you giving moments of your life mm. and moments of your time. Mm. So it's very similar to this whole uh, concept of you sacrificing something right. for the sake of Allah. And this is why whenever I meet volunteers, whenever I meet people uh, like yourself, I'm always inspired by them. I'm always inspired by them because I know, you know, just that value of giving that time is immeasurable. Right. And mm. you don't know what it could do for someone as well. Someone mm. can watch mm. one video of yours, which yeah. is maybe one minute, and they could change their whole life over it. Does that make Very sense? Allah, Allah, yeah. Sorry for flipping the script, <laughs> myself, but I just wanted to kind of like. No, I really know, like that. Alhamdulillah. Obviously, you guys. Uh, Muhammad, you're, you're a mentor, isn't it? So yeah. you mentor quite a lot of people, inshallah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is something that is a technique that you use to, in terms of your mentorship, make, give them that belief that they have, they're doing something significant or they can do something significant. Mm. Mm. Uh, I think that's you know, it's a really good point to, to, to have or a really good um, point to accentuate because what you're doing is you're saying, look, Everyone here has a purpose. Everyone here can bring value to people. Yeah. It's just about choosing what's of value and it will suit you and what your characteristics. Um, I mean, obviously, do you have an icebreaker or do, can we just yeah. get straight into it? No, I can tell you two things. Yeah. So, um, 
Uh, I'll share I'll share two quick things with you. First of all, I want to tell you about this guy called Dietrich. Dietrich, uh, Dietrich. Dietrich. Like weird name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> his name's Dietrich. He's an Austrian guy. He's basically like a salesperson, like yeah. I used to be, and he's flying around the Far East. And right. while he's flying around, he's in an airport. He's very tired, right? Yeah. Like we are. So he goes into a shop and he has, uh, he's thinking, what shall I drink, right? So he's got different drinks there. Yeah. So he picks up a drink and he goes, okay, I'll buy this. So he buys the drink, he goes off, he gets on the plane and stuff. He drinks the drink and he's like, wow, this drink is really cool. I really like this drink, right? Yeah. And I'm like, I wonder what it's all about, this, that and the other, right? So anyway, he gets home and he says, you know what? This drink is amazing. We need it in Europe. Mm. So then he basically brings the drink over to Europe and he starts a whole business around that whole drink. Right. Do you know what the name of that drink is? Cafenero? <laughs> Fanta. Red Bull. Oh, Red wow. Bull. Red Bull. And Red oh, Bull okay. now actually has a huge culture around it. I've never drunk Red yeah, Bull, by yeah. the way, but I'm it just does, saying that yeah, yeah. the culture around it is huge now. Massive, they had this yeah, guy yeah. who jumped from space. Yeah, I don't know if yeah, you remember. Yeah. He like just... All of these have you seen things. it? I saw, no, I saw this thing yesterday where he jumped from mountain range. He jumped on a plane. Yeah, so mountain range is cool. Yeah. But this guy is like literally... The, it looks like he's going to miss the earth if he drops, right? So he falls out of it. So they have a huge culture, they're worth billions now, yeah. okay? And what Dietrich did was he took that from, uh, from Thailand yeah. and he brought it to the UK, he did great branding with it and he basically made it into this phenomena that it is right mm. now, okay? But one big question for you. Imagine that Dietrich was in that shop again. What if he had one. chosen water? Mm. It wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened? Yeah. How different would his life be if he had chosen water? Mm. Completely different, yeah. right? Yeah. Completely different, right? Now he's a billionaire, he's like Sahana, known all yeah. over the world, he's yeah. created this whole culture. But if he had picked water, that's it. None of this would have been bad. Nothing. And this is it. One decision yeah. can change your destiny forever. Mm -hmm. right? And this is why it's so important to say Bismillah and to involve Allah in every decision in you decision. make. Because you don't know, just tying your shoelaces over here could mean that you miss a pane of glass that drops there and kills mm. someone. Yeah, that's true. Right. So Allah. every I mean, decision you, you make, you, you see those yeah. videos on, you, on Facebook and stuff. There's no yeah. misses yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. Near, and like that guy could have just made the decision: I'm going to lay in bed yeah, for one yeah. second longer, or I'll get up one second quicker. Yeah. yeah. And this is what life. Life is all about decisions that you make, and it takes your destiny completely different. Subhanallah. The second story was. I don't know if we've got time for that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe later. I think that's a good way to introduce it. Allah yeah. Akbar. Yeah, that's that. That mindset is right there already. I mean, you can from also you can also say that uh, like. Allah's, Allah's decree as well. Yeah. That Allah Allah puts you in situations where you're blessed and you you have the opportunity, uh, and so like you could also have that aspect as well. Yeah. Because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the ultimate, uh, you know, decision, decision maker. Yeah, decision maker yeah. in your entire yeah. life. And I think trust in Allah is a huge thing. Yeah. Uh, whether you're yeah. an entrepreneur, whether you're uh, someone trying to do good in the world, whatever you are, um, it's it's funny because if you look at the non-Muslims books. A person development wise, yeah. there's so many books out there that they'll say, whatever happens to you, just believe that it's good. Mm. Yeah. Believe that's good. And they've got no reason for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're so lucky as Muslims that we, we know, know the Prophet said, yeah. Ajib is the situation yeah. of the believer, that whatever good happens, whatever happens to him is good for him. If something bad happens, he says, Alhamdulillah, and it's mm. made good for him. Yeah. Right? So we have real evidence as to why we should believe that. But the yeah. non Muslims push this methodology, just do it. Just so believe that and your life will be better. Yeah. It's just, it's just something that's intrinsic within humans to, yeah. to, to understand that concept. Alhamdulillah, we have like a, a way to rationalize yep. it. Our own Same life. with gratitude. Yeah. Yes, because exactly. Because all the non-Muslim uh, thinkers out there, the rich yeah. guys and everything, and the, even the wealthy billionaires and stuff, they'll say, go and give. If you give, you'll yeah. get more. Yeah. And we know Allah has told us already, to right? Yeah. That if you give thanks, Allah's going to give you more. Yeah. And so stuff. many of these kind of like... Uh, you know, really famous kind of uh, motivational speakers yes. that you see. A lot of them say, when you wake up first thing in the morning, just be grateful. Yes. You know, just wake up and write a few yep. things of gratitude. It's, uh, in my mind, I'm always wondering why, why would they do that? I know the reason why I would do that. Why I'll, you know, we wake up and make the dua in the morning and that we're grateful that Allah has brought us into life and to have had barakah during our mm. day and everything. I know why we do that, but why they do it, it's just so it's, 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 it's like amazing to, to, to think and about. And as you get I, deeper into this uh, personal development, you'll see that there's so many concepts that overlap, that, that overlap yeah. and we have real reasons for them. So yeah. we have the conviction behind it. We have the conviction it. behind it, yeah. we know why we should think like that, and we have the evidence for it as well. Mm. Whereas for them, it's just like blind faith, just, just do it. Yeah, mm. it's, something, mean, it's something that they've learned through experience, but... We've been given it through guidance. Exactly. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, like, you know, uh, this mindset that you have, 
it, all of these concepts that you give in tawakkul and you know have, being having shukr, being grateful to Allah, thanking Allah. I mean, this shift of my, this is like more of like a shift of mindset yeah. if you consider your early early like you know mm, growing yeah. up and stuff like that. Could you talk a bit more about that? Like, because yeah. I think you you mentioned to me before that you uh, went to Pakistan when yeah. you were about fifteen, sixteen. Yeah. And that was a pivotal stage in your life. Could you talk a bit more about that, inshallah? Yeah. But before I do that, I want to tell you one more thing, right? Yeah. Is, like you said, like all this kind of mindset. The other mindset I now have is basically of really high standards. Okay. So for me, like when I was thinking about uh, this podcast and this video yeah. and being here with you guys, I was like, you know what? This has to be the best one. <laughs> <laughs> like it has to be the best one ever, inshallah. Yeah? inshallah. In the sense that... Uh, best one for who? Not for me to look good yeah. or anything. Best one in the fact that it actually impacts, exactly. it influences and it changes yeah. someone else's life yeah. and makes a huge difference. I want mm -hmm. someone to watch this once and be like, you know what? This changed my life. Right? So I have that standard. I want it to be better than anyone else's for the sake of Allah. Yeah. yeah. Right? Um, yeah. And I think it's very important we have those high standards. Because same, the Prophet said, when you make dua for Jannah, you make dua for the highest part. Yeah. yeah. He didn't say go there with a low mindset, you know what, mm. just get the lowest part of Jannah. So why is it when I come here and sit with you guys, I have the mindset, oh, for me to be fake humble, let me just like yeah. do an okay job here. Yeah. Why? We should be at the highest standards. Mm. And so the reason why that's so important for me now is because it wasn't like that for me at all when I was growing up. Like yeah. um, when I was younger, there's different things that teachers say when you have report cards, right? Uh, some people say, oh, he's a very good child, this and the other. My teachers consistently, I remember going to one parents' evening with my dad and almost all the teachers said, he has potential. <laughs> Right? And that's something you say to dumb kids. That's how I saw it, right? <laughs> that because you're dumb, they're saying he has potential, meaning maybe one day he'll do something. Yeah, I had yeah. something a bit worse. I, I, my, my geography teacher said to me, you're an enigma. It basically okay. means you're good at some things, but you're really, really bad at it. But enigma sounds good, though. <laughs> it does sound good. It sounds good. It's another it one of those good. things, right? It does sound good until you research it. Yeah. Then, but I know, I know what it feels like as well. But anyway, like carry on and show yeah. us. So that's, that's what happened. Like, I used to feel like, you know what, I was very average. Yeah. Very average in, in everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was about 15, uh, my family decided to move back to Pakistan. They wanted to kind of uh, go back and spend a few years there mm. and stuff. Uh, and before then, like I said, low <laughs> standards. My education wasn't that great. When I got to Pakistan, I went to this uh, English medium school. It was like an army yeah, yeah. Catholic school, very like posh school. Catholic? Yeah, it was a Catholic school. You didn't know there was Christian and Muslim. There were a lot of Christians. I didn't know Christians. that. Didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. It was run by some Australian nuns, actually. Okay. okay. Um, and there were some English nuns there and stuff as well. They're Very posh. They're giving that quite yeah, hard, hard yeah. So we went there. And um, you know when you go from London, because my whole life I lived in London, you expect that, okay, who am I going to fight on the first day of school? Because <laughs> yeah. right? the kind of secondary school yeah, I went yeah. to was a bit like that. Yeah. Um, and when I got there, it was very different. Like It was like, you know, when teachers came in the class, Students stood up. Yeah, back straight. And when, when they were speaking to them, they would stand up and speak mm. to them. Mm. And so it was like awakening for me that, oh my God, this is how you actually respect teachers. Right. This is how you yeah. actually behave with teachers, mm. right? Um, but then also what I thought is these Pakistanis or, you know, uh, what do they know about English? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they're learning in an English school. <laughs> I'm coming from England. Yeah. I'm going to show these boys <laughs> how you actually be in a school. Because yeah. I thought I was at an advantage now because yeah. I'm coming from the land of English. More privileged yeah. in a way. And I'm coming to this country where they don't know English. Yeah. Yeah. So I went Their standards there, are a bit lower. Much lower. I've had more, yeah. better education standards. Exactly. So I'm going to smash this. Yeah. So I got there, first year, failed everything. SubhanAllah. <laughs> everything except English, my beloved English, <laughs> and geography. I failed it all. And, you know, in those countries, if you fail, you stay in the same year. So, so oh I was in a very difficult position. But Alhamdulillah, my dad, he went, he speeched to the woman and he said, look, you have to move him. And they said, okay, if he can make an improvement, this, that and the other. Yeah. So that whole failure, like most people in their lives, when they fail at something, it really kind of made me think about things much deeper. Mm. Right. And then when I started to apply myself, I realized that education was something valuable. Right. Because somewhere like Pakistan, they've got state schools, so they've got children who don't go to school. Yeah, yeah, it true. made me realize that education is actually something very powerful. Yeah. And very and it's a bit like, you know how some people go to prisons and they learn about suddenly they've got books and they've got yeah, education. Yeah, yeah. It was like that for me. And those okay. people had very high standards, they were very posh, they were you, like... You see the difference between those kids that are going to yes. school and those who are not. Whereas yes. over here, we see Everyone's pretty much school. everyone yeah, is in school. Yeah. So it's always a standard. Yeah. For granted, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. So, so that whole episode, when I failed and then I started to get back into it, I realised that education had some real value and I realised 
what it could actually do for me. Mm. Um, and then it also changed my mindset because before I went, I had never thought about really, I mean, we were expected to go uni because no one in our family had ever gone uni. Oh, but right. at the same time, I never knew if I could make it. I never knew yeah. if I could do it. So when I went there, um, I did that. Uh, I stayed there for a few years. It was a life-changing experience for me. When I came back to this country, I was actually 17. I had no qualifications. Oh. So I'm back here in, in, in England again, but no qualifications. Yeah. Uh, I was worse than a failure. Because I went to college and I said, I want to do GCSEs because yeah. I've never done GCSEs. In Pakistan, yeah. we didn't do it. And they said, sorry, you haven't failed GCSEs, so you can't do it. <laughs> right? The only way you can do it is if you go back to school. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not going back to school. Yeah. Yeah. So I started on this whole you'd, path. You'd go, you were, what, you were 17. Yeah. And you'd have to go back to like, yeah, 15. 10, maybe like 15. Yeah, so I'd be so like, yeah, like 10, 11 or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So then I said, I'm not going back to college. And I started uh, to do something called GNVQ. Okay. Now, yeah. all of us that were on there, uh, especially you intellectual guys, yeah? you're like, Jimmy Q. We used to call it going nowhere very quickly. <laughs> right? Because it, like, it was like the lesser, it was like seen as lower than GCSE. No, but it's vocational. More vo yeah, it's, vo it's yeah, more vocational. Yeah, yeah. But at that time, you know, people who were doing A-levels, they always looked down on us. Yeah, yeah. Because they're like, oh, this guy's doing Jimmy Q. They didn't know I came from Pakistan, right? So back when we were in sixth form, like anybody who did something that was a bit like lower standard, yeah. we'd, say, we'd say that's that's B tech. Exactly, B tech. We just yeah. call it, yeah, that's, that's, so that's right. For example, so, somebody yeah. worked in Prime, I'm like, oh, yeah. that's B tech. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is the irony of it. You see the the mindset, yeah. <laughs> that we were on the GMVQ course yeah. and we all called it going nowhere very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> to our self-deprecation, yeah. right? So anyway, but um, once I came back from Pakistan, to be honest, like um, education was a breeze for me. The stuff that I learned there in two years, it took my mindset to another level mm. uh, and it raised my standards. Right, okay. Right? And after that, like, uh, in my GMEQ uh, intermediate, I got a distinction. I studied business. In my oh. advance, I got a distinction. And then even when I went to uni, I kind of cruised through uni. Yeah. Um, uni, you know, Pakistanis were very good at mathematics. Yeah. Yeah. We weren't allowed to use calculators there. You know, for, you know, uh, oh, really? they have, yeah, you know, you have sine and cosine yeah, yeah, yeah. math. They would give you a book. Oh, so you weren't allowed to have a calculator oh, wow. and you would open up the book and then you work out the cosine and everything oh, like that. Everything wow. was done uh, mentally. They had, like, the tables there. Yeah, tables and things like that. Yeah. So oh, like maths okay. was a very strong point. So what and I did... you did maths and statistics or business and So statistics. I did business and statistics yeah. and uh, information systems. Okay. okay. Um, and what I did is I picked my modules very carefully. Mm -hmm. So I, anything that had maths in it, I was like, bring it in. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's why I bought information systems because a lot of coding is mathematical. Yes. Oh, so, so you learned coding at university? Yeah, so I learned basic coding there as well. So I brought that in and those things things pushed me up to a first in uni. And when, right. you, when you graduated, that was just after the dot-com bubble? Uh, yeah, just it? after I graduated in 2003, yeah. Because I think that obviously, um, I studied IT at that time, or and mathematics, stuff like that. It really did like, I think that's a really good time to study it. Mm. Um, because you can use that skill and create businesses and they would, yeah. they would be very successful. Yeah, because I think my generation is quite lucky uh, because we were the generation that transitioned into the tech that's there today. Like yeah. my children, when they're growing up now, uh, they will always have known the internet, Yeah. right? Mm. But I remember sitting in Pakistan and looking at this screen and hearing that noise that you hear yeah. with yeah. dial-up, right? And going, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> like going, what is this thing, right? Yeah. You know, uh, this, is, this is insane, right? And it just shows how different life is right now. Um, life, is, life is going really quick, isn't it? It's going quick, changing. but the way things are different is insane now. So, for example, yeah. when I was a when I was a kid, I was crazy about football. Yeah, yeah. typical Pakistani Liverpool FC, right? <laughs> so, I'm in Pakistan, and I've been wrenched. My life has gone from being a teenager in Pakistan to yeah. being like in the village or being in Rawalpindi or wherever we <laughs> lived, right? And so, I wanted to know what's happening with Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. So, this is what would happen. I would write a letter with my hands, yeah? I'd write a letter with my <laughs> hands and I'd say, uh, dear Fahim or dear uh, Tosi for whoever, please tell me what's going on in the, in the at that time I think it was Division One, right? Yeah. What's going on in, in, in football? So I would send that letter then wow. via someone who's going to England. Oh my God. Right? Then I would wait and that guy, he's going through his normal life. For me, it's everything, right? But maybe two months later, I would get one letter back. So and in the know. letter, it would say, right, this is what's happening in London with us, lot, because it was too expensive to call guys. Yeah. And then he would, be, he would do a table of the league, oh, top three or gosh. four. That's right. And if Liverpool weren't there, he would tell me where they are. You know, it's really, it's really strange. I think like, some people nowadays, they actually miss that. Because I was, I was checking the App Store. One of the most trending app applications you get, I'm not going to really build the name, but uh, it's an app that sends letters. Mm. Now, that is personally made, it, that it's, it's made so... It takes hours to send, not not days or months. It's not that it's not that extreme. Mm. Okay. And I was checking the comments. Some people were complaining, saying they should make it longer, take it a few, maybe a week or two, three weeks. So when I send a message, 
it should arrive two, three weeks later and then when mm. they come back yep. two, three weeks after that. And so I was thinking, subhanAllah, like maybe people, maybe there's that loss of contact. Obviously, mm. you're looking at it from that perspective. But also it's that sort of we're yearning for something like that as well, isn't mm. it? We're learning for that sort of simplicity. And and also if you look in our Islamic heritage as well, people would travel for months mm. just to get just to deliver a message. When I hear stories like that, the first thing I'm thinking, yeah. what if he's dead? Mm. Yeah. What if by the time you read that he's dead? Yeah. What if by the time you re you reach that he's not he's not in the country? Mm. You know? he's, he's left while you're going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and a, a story, a really amazing, remarkable story, Imam Ahmed Rahimallah, he, he was known for his asceticism. He would travel for months. Yeah. Once a scholar came uh, to the region where he's li living and his fellow uh, friend who's also a scholar they're all scholars, they're all scholars anyway they said to Imam Muhammad, let's go to meet the scholar he's here in our own country mm. it's a blessing yeah? and Imam Muhammad actually became a bit angry and upset he said, I made intention to study with him all the way in Yemen I don't want to ruin my intention <laughs> <laughs> and, and so when he came and even spoke to the sheikh that was there. It's like I know, I, you know, my my. He said like my uh, plan is ruined, you know. Mm -hmm. And subhanallah, his intention was so good that he didn't actually study with him. Only when he went back, and then he, he went, went to make intention to go there. Oh my gosh! And, and then when he went there, he was waiting in the. You know, he knocked on the door. Uh, he knocked on the door, and the the sheikh's uh, uh, admin, what do you call it, opened the door and said, "Look, you can't come here." You have to, you know, he's a, he's a very big sheikh. Obviously, he didn't know he was speaking to Muhammad. Yeah, mm. yeah. And you know, you have to wait here. So he just waited on, on the, in the in front the of doorstep. the door, doorstep. Mm. You know, this is mm. and Imam Ahmed was known, like as one of the biggest scholars. Yeah. Even though he was like 15, 16 years younger than Imam Shafi'i, and he was a very good student, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Shafi'i considered him on the same level. Mm. You know, and that's and then when Imam Sami was so Imam Ahmed, you know, who is it really him? You know, he started to cry because it's like this sheikh has come all the way here. At my doorstep, mm. just to seek hadith mm. from me. But anyway, the the purpose I'm trying to make is that sort of like that sort of lifestyle as well. That sort of you know that helped you have a mind to like you know shift your mind in terms of seeing the true purpose of life, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And if you fast forward a few years, I want to talk about your next uh, shift mind, mind sh uh, when your mind shifted. Yeah. Was when you uh, just finished university. Yeah. You, so just one thing I wanted to say about uh, what you said. Very interesting that you know this whole lifestyle change now. One thing the old lifestyle required was integrity. In what way would you mean? So, for example, I say to you, Shreve, you know what? Tomorrow, I will meet you here at 10.45. Yeah. Okay? We don't have, like, mobile phones, right? Okay. Maybe, maybe you don't even have a house phone or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. What's going to happen on that day? You will be there at 10.45. You won't message me saying, yeah. I'm going to be 12 minutes late. Yeah. I might not make... It's that people had this mindset of integrity mm. that, look, if I've said I'm going to do this, gonna I'm going to do this. Be, yeah. Because there's not that form of communication. Yeah. It's like me saying, I'm coming in a letter I write to you. I'm coming on the 12th of July at 8 p.m. I'll arrive in Heathrow, pick me up. Yeah. Right? So that integrity was at another level there, as there's well. Because no, there's, no, there's no shield on either yeah. side to be like, okay. Flexibility. Could, yeah, a flexibility. Yeah. Okay, okay, I could potentially, you know wake up a little bit later, let them yes. know, okay, I'll take this train instead of that yeah. one, and then I'll get there a bit and, and this is a problem because it actually affects the standards. Yeah. Because if I know that I can be late when I meet you, yeah. then my standards for lateness go down. Yeah. yeah. Right. But if I know there's no way I can't be late, yeah. my standard will be higher. You and don't want to let them down, yeah. there's no way of... Yeah. You know, and this is what would happen yeah. sometimes in, in organisations I've worked in. I was very strict with people on timings. Right. And they would always be on time for my meeting. Because if they didn't, they would get destroyed. Uh, <laughs> right, they'll get destroyed. It doesn't matter if it's a big scholar, whoever it is, yeah. if they're late, they're gonna get destroyed, right? But what happened is people actually started changing their behavior. And I found some of them would come on time for my meetings all the time, but for other people, they wouldn't because the standards we set is what people respond to, yeah, right? So I just want to say that anyway. No, that was really, I, like, I, like, uh, I like these tangents, yeah. You know? yeah. That, no, that, that was really amazing. It's like, wow, that's so yeah. true, yeah. That part, part about you know, integrity. As, as I was coming today, I was a bit late, so I can see why he made that objection. But I was thinking, yeah, if, you, if you were working for me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wallahi, you know, yeah. Uh, wallahi, on the way, like just two rows away, I, I was from, from arriving, I was thinking in my head, you know, like, you know, it's really important to have integrity. I don't know, I, I should have maybe planned to come at least half an hour early yeah. just for this podcast. Yeah. Uh, and I was thinking about all these things, regret, everything like that. Uh, but you obviously have some regrets as well. You're talking yeah. about your regrets, yeah. inshallah. Yeah, good. Just switch on. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was a good move there. Is it? <laughs> yeah. um, so one thing that happened for me, alhamdulillah, that while I was at university, I kind of cruised through university. I didn't really have to work that hard. My yeah. first came yeah. reasonably easy. Um, and I just wasted a lot of time at uni. Yeah. 
You know, I wasn't right. that religious practicing type and I just wasted a lot of time, did sure. a lot of rubbish. Um, but uni was a kind of point where uh, it changed my life uh, completely, alhamdulillah, because for the first time I really experienced like really good Juma khutbas. Okay. Right? So in English, you know, because uh, my local yeah, masjid yeah, 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 was always like Urdu, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. to actually That's experience me. Islam with some yeah. ISOC brother who was like the head of it, yeah, yeah. right? And then there was obviously the Hizb Tahrir brothers yeah. who would like tell you about things and they would get you interested <laughs> politically yeah, and yeah. stuff. So anyway, yeah, I started hyped. getting interested in the last year. Yeah. And I remember one Ramadan. Uh, Ramadan's a great time for ISOCs actually because like, Every, yeah, all the Muslims yeah, get involved yeah, in that. Yeah, I thought yeah, you guys yeah, being presidents, good. you know. Um, so I was just a, a, a nobody, everyday kind of Muslim who's going to the prayer room. And I remember seeing one of the ISOC heads, a guy, he had this massive crate of like chicken. I boxes. thought you were going to say a massive beard. No, no, no. <laughs> he, had, he had this massive box, right? Yeah. And in that box, he had like two piece chicken and chips. You know how you okay, get two yeah, piece yeah, chicken? Yeah, yeah. And he was carrying it like that and he was struggling and he was going. And I'm outside, we had little huts, it was at Middlesex Uni, and I was looking oh, you're at... Oh, Middlesex Uni? Oh, Middlesex Uni, oh, okay, yeah, no, business school. And I was standing outside, I'm looking at him, and I'm looking at all the guys waiting for food in the, in the hut. Yeah. And I'm looking at him, and I'm thinking, whoa, like, who are you? And I was like, I'm those guys waiting for him yeah. to come and give this to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you want to be part of that? You wanted, no, to be, I, you wanted to be that person to give. No, but at that moment, I realised I felt like a loser. Yeah. Because yeah. I was like, I'm just like being a taker. Yeah. I'm just cruising through yeah, life, yeah. I'm being a taker, and this is the hero. SubhanAllah. This guy's the hero, yeah. right? This ISOC guy, who's basically, God knows what his struggles are, he's probably not even as good as me at uni and stuff, so he's probably doing his studies, and he's doing this, and he's doing that, but yet, he's here to give me food. Mm. And for me, that was just like a switch went on, like, whoa, like, you're a loser. Mm. And it's, it's quite a difficult thing to take when you're doing very well academically. Because yeah, right, yeah. normally people see academics as, as the be all, that's, right? Yeah, you're yeah. doing really well, success, you yeah. might get first, you're, you're doing you're great. Sorted, yeah. But my mindset was, whoa, you're actually a loser. Mm, because what are you doing to add value to people's lives? Because Allah, Allah. my parents, my mum and dad, they've always been, the, they've been givers their whole lives. Yeah. Right? right? Yeah. And they've always given to me, they've allowed me to do things in my life. And I was like, oh, I'm not like that. Mm, or oh, I've become not like that. Right? So that moment for me was like a big awakening. And suddenly I went into this mode that when you realize what you are, you actually start regretting. Yeah. So I had massive regrets about these last two, three years that I've just spent in uni. Because I'm like, this is the time when you're free. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm going to go to work. I'm going to get fully into work. These years I've just wasted. Right? Yeah. And, and, you know, most of us, I think we've been through our lives and we've wasted. But it was a huge realization So what happened after that then? But so, just before yeah. that, just to say that, I think that's a very interesting point for brothers that are involved in ISOC to take away, even though that's a benefit for somebody who's not in ISOC to kind of yeah. see that experience. But for the brother that is carrying the boxes of chicken, somebody who's doing that right now, it's for him to realise that actually that one act of you, you know, coming down and trying to do that, volunteer your time, yeah. it can have this kind of effect. Yeah. And you won't even know it. You, you probably didn't even go up to that brother or the group of no, brothers and say, no look, this really no helped idea. me or anything. They yeah. had no idea. Yeah. So that could be the same thing, yeah. just to keep when, in your mind that And when you start thinking about like, the things I've done in my life since that point, goes back exactly. to that kind of brother, it's, it's and crazy. He, he would have no idea about right? that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, you it's guys called, probably... It's called servant leadership, isn't it? Yeah. You, just, yeah. you guys probably wouldn't be asking me to come here if it wasn't it for wasn't that for incident, yeah. you know? Oh, no, no. That's what I said about, that about their trick chips. again. Yeah, yeah. Their trick again, right? So, that. so yeah. at that point, um, what makes I think... Makes you appreciate life as well, isn't it? Makes you yeah. appreciate life that, you know, such a small decision can make a huge impact, mm. not just in your life, but other people's yep. lives. Mm. SubhanAllah. Because you're still, you're recalling this how many years ago, this very long time ago, yeah. so yet you still remember this... Ago, 15, 20 years ago, This yeah. was a change in mindset, and you still remember yeah. this based on this one brother, yeah. selfless act. Yeah. Very inconvenient. A lot, a lot, a yeah. lot of times, a lot of like, let it be known in terms of ISOC, Charity Week, whatever. Because yeah. Charity Week's happening right yeah, now. Yeah, that's true. Like a lot of people just like work hectic, uh, and often maybe they don't have they don't they don't have the right intention of Allah But generally, the the effort they put in, and they don't really see that effort, or they don't feel yeah. as though it's made impact. Let it be known, it, ha- it does make an yeah, impact. Definitely. It really does. And, and this is very important for um, the whole mindset around giving because. Um, you know, like I said, I mean, because from that moment, what happened then in my mind is like, right, you know what, screw this. I'm changing the way I live my life now mm. in terms of this element, right? Um, and so what I said from that point is that now I need to basically become someone who's going to add value and give to others, yeah. right? And so at that point, I kind of used that regret then to go off and do different things. So that very next year, I came back to uni, even though I wasn't at uni. Well, I and I, anymore, no, yeah. I wasn't a student, nothing. And I decided to help. 
with him. Ramadan right, food. Because okay. I knew okay. a caterer and this yeah. and that. Yeah. So I started helping with food. So and that was my real first experience into like volunteering yeah, yeah, and doing yeah. things for the sake of Allah and stuff. And it just it just changed my life forever. Wow. I mean, let's 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 like fast fast forward up to now, because hmm. we just got we started right from the beginning, yeah, yeah, yeah. right now. So you you set up, you've founded two companies, uh, three companies, you've helped set up big companies, and these kind of companies are those you would you know you would you see and very dominant in the Muslim yeah. in the Muslim realm. Yeah, uh, DAO organizations stuff like that. So you've been in the founding companies or committees of these yeah. organizations. I mean, like, and it's very interesting because all of these aspects that you've done, may Allah bless you. They, they've, mm. they, they're there for impact. They're there for the DAO. They're there yeah. for very important and purposeful endeavors. But it is very interesting to see the backstory behind all of this. Mm. How it starts from very small little acts, seeing things, reflecting as well. It's an act of reflecting. You had to reflect over that person. Carrying those boxes yeah. Yeah. to make you feel as if that's it. I have something to do yeah. with my life. Yeah. So it's it's very interesting how it, if you if you look at the right now the end of result, inshallah, the start result, the start of something, and you can see like you know subhanallah how it can all start mm. and where it can lead to yeah. as well, isn't what it? What builds on how how it helps build one thing on top of the other. Because yeah. obviously when you're there, you you only realize those those things. Once you get to this point, mm. right? Once you've had all those experiences, and now you realize how that built on top of each other. Mm. Yeah. So, like, I want to move on to the next topic, inshallah, because uh, you've founded one one organization, uh, and I was telling Shaib this as well, and, and you as well. Uh, when you sent me the video on WhatsApp, the Muslim Mastery, the organization that you yeah. set up, it helps it helps towards building mindset, isn't it? Towards, yeah. For, for Muslims. Yeah. Uh, in essence, and when you sent me that, I was like, oh. I was checking out their, uh, you know, I've got their podcast, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, when we were discussing we've the meetings, we've been, meetings, we've so been looking, yeah, mm. we were looking through various Muslim podcasts when we yeah. started our podcast, you know, what we can use for inspiration and stuff. And yours came up on it, and it's it's so interesting to see, uh, you know, what you know what you're doing in that aspect. But you haven't just done that; you've done other things as well. You've set up other, you've, you've set up a digital agency, right? Mm. Yeah. And uh, you're also working in another organization. Uh, is that called La Life, right? Life Digital is a company. Yeah, you have, Life yeah. Digital, and then yeah. the other one is. Uh, you have is um, what's the other company that you have? You have so the uh, main thing I do right now is Muslim Mastery, which is focused yeah. on uh, helping Muslims to have breakthroughs. Yeah, uh, that's one of the main things. It's all about the mindset and stuff because you can see how a slight twist in my mindset just shifted my whole life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and within that, I do communications training, I do public speaker training. Uh, because communication is such a huge part of life and stuff. I'm sure we're going to go on to that later. That was on. the next part, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, Life Digital is a growth agency that I run. Yeah, uh, it's called Life Digital because in life we believe that you're either growing or you're dying. Like if you look okay. at nature, yeah, it's either the plant is growing or it's dead yeah. or it's yeah. dying, right? And this is how we believe that uh, businesses and Muslim organizations should be, that they should be continuously growing. Right. Because yeah. if you're not continuously growing, yeah. then you, you're dying basically. There's no, there's no, there's no stalemate. There's no, there's no, there's no middle yeah. ground. Yeah. Right? And this is why yeah. I think that uh, on, a, on a, like a daily basis, like education and development and growth is so important. Yeah. Uh, and me personally, like I've fallen in love with growth, education, development, all this thing, and that's why I spend my time coaching people. Yeah. I help Muslim organisations to grow, non-Muslim organisations to grow. Let's talk. A, let's talk a bit more about that, actually, in terms of mentoring and coaching yeah. and stuff like that. So you mentioned growth is one of the really important aspects. Yeah. When it comes to growth, I mean, like the way I see it is that you have to constantly innovate, constantly check what's going on, re, you know, re reiterate, yes. and change. And I think that when I look at Muslim organisations, I think that they have a very simple simple mindset with raising business and having business and they are kind of being shifted because times are changing mm. and they are not adapting to suit that change mm. Mm. but you also have some other aspects like for example you told me downstairs that they're also missing different strands like marketing yeah. and sales mm. but what would you advise in terms of you know when you uh, look at uh, these organizations and you help people build these organizations what kind mm. of advice would you give to them Right, so when it comes to organisation, there's so many different elements to it, right? Um, I think that the first thing we need to think about is, like, objective. Like, what is it that we're actually trying to achieve? Mm. Sometimes it just kind of comes together, right? Uh, sometimes it's planned. Like, you know, maybe you guys thought about this podcast, you thought, how are we going to do it? You sat down, you wrote it all out yeah. and things like that, right? Um, I think the biggest gap is that we as Muslims are not, educating ourselves in the fields that we need to yeah right right so you have a muslim organization which is great when it comes to 
uh, you know, the knowledge of Islam and all these kind of things. Yeah. But the things that will help us to grow our organizations and our institutions, they're not good at. Sure. When it comes to people management and leadership, yeah. people are terrible. Yeah. They don't know how to manage people. Yeah. How are you going to build a great organization? Because if you look at organizations and businesses, in essence, they're people coming together exactly. for a common objective. Exactly. Yeah. So one, you have the common objective, and second is the people. So if you don't master these two yeah. things, yeah. what's going to happen? You're gonna you're gonna have a deficient organization, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, and what what are businesses there to do? Organization there to do? They are there to actually let's switch it on you. What are businesses there to do? <laughs> businesses are there to cater a certain service for the people. Okay. Product as well. Why? Uh, demand. To do what? That to particular add, thing. To add value. Very good. Excellent. Add value, right? Yeah. Most people say to make money, but the way they make money yeah. uh, is is just another form of value. Money right. is a is a means, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So organizations, yeah, especially, okay. are there to add value, yeah. Yeah. right? And so what you need to get good at is actually adding value, mm. right? Mm. And different organizations will add different value. Yeah. So right now, you know, us being here and people watching this, it adds a certain value for them, yeah. right? Inshallah. Same with organizations that they come together to add value. Uh, there's a famous management consultant. His name's Peter Drucker. He said business is about two things. Number one, innovation. And innovation, I would define it as new ways of adding yeah. value. Not new ways of adding value. Yeah, no, not be that. Yeah. <laughs> Good be that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so one is to add uh, value in new ways. Yeah. Right. Um, the second, he said, is all about marketing. Right. So he's like, if you get adding value right, meaning having yeah. a great product, actually doing what you're supposed to do, yeah, yeah. and benefiting people, yeah. the only other strand you need to master is actually getting that message Into out there. Into the people. Yeah. yeah. But the problem is, Muslim organizations, when they start, it's like us three brothers get together, right, let's start a charity. We want to do good for the sake of Allah. Let's give money to orphans. Okay, great, let's get orphans. So we start doing the work for it. That's called operations. Yeah. Right? Okay. So that covers everything that we're doing. And every Muslim organization will have ops, whether they call it that or not, but they'll be doing the work. That's, this, that's, that's, that, that's, that's the, the doing the work part. Yeah. Then they have the other side, which is finance. Because what happens is when we set up a co company, we're like, oh, it's a charity. Okay, charity commission said we have to submit accounts. So we yeah. need an accountant or bookkeeper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or company's house will say, you've got a limited company, you need to submit accounts. Mm -hmm. So now we have ops generally because we want to do that work. Finance is forced upon us because of, because of legislation. Yeah. Yeah. right? And then the only stream that's left in management theory is actually marketing. Mm. Also HR as well. HR and admin, you could say, come under yeah. finance. Yeah. Oh, under finance. Yeah. Okay. Because this is a general running of it, right? Okay. When it comes to this element of marketing, Muslims as a whole just neglect Flop. it. Uh. So I've spoken to big Muslim organizations. Yeah. They've got operations, they've got finance and admin and HR. Yeah. That's it. What, what is it that, what, what is the common denominator you've seen through them that makes them want to kind of ignore the marketing side? They don't ignore it. It's a case of naturally they've evolved to doing things and they're adding things on rather yeah. than sitting down and thinking, okay, what do we do to what make organizations? What we have now, yeah. how do we... Yeah, exactly. So the problem with this, this is the real problem with it. Like in, in a way with like marketing, so what? It's not there. It's not a big issue. Yeah, yeah. It's a huge issue. Why? Because marketing is your engine for growth. Yeah. Marketing right? Yeah. And if you don't have that growth, then the value you can bring is limited. Yeah. Mm. If I'm in 50 countries in 50 different cities, I'm going to bring more value than if I'm in one city. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So this whole economic engine, this is what we actually help organizations to try and build that and try do you and bring think, it out. Do you think that uh, one of the problems might be that somebody, some of these Muslim organizations, the people around them have kind of internalized this aspect of humbleness to more of an extreme standard that they feel that everything they possibly can do has to be at the most modest in the sense that they don't want to be out there to seem that they're there to spread their, their organization and you know make lots of money yeah. from it and, and et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that could be a factor that's yeah. leading them to being like, okay, we shouldn't focus on that marketing so much? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if we're, are we allowed to say a dirty word on this show? Is it a halal dirty word? It's a halal dirty word. Yes, Can I say it? Yes. Yeah. Are you sure? Yes. Yeah. Okay, selling. SubhanAllah, <laughs> how could selling. you say that? <laughs> selling is a dirty word, right? It's a dirty word usually, right? If yeah, I said to you, you know what guys, let's sell Islam. No, if I'm honest with you, yeah, if, yeah. I hear, if I heard the word sell, immediately I'm thinking like, oh, it's guy, one not, time not, not in my high horse, I'm thinking, look, you can probably have an ulterior motive. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. The true reality is you can't, the true things that really matter, they don't need to be sold. Mm. They just need to be believed in. And maybe I'd use the word convince mm. or encourage. 
But when you hear the word sell... So you're not comfortable with that word I'm not sell, comfortable right? because yeah. me personally, when, <laughs> when I've seen... No, I, I'm very good to discuss this. So yeah. When I see... When I was growing up and, and dealing with Muslims doing business and trade, I, I saw there was a heavy, heavy bartering. I saw mm. there was a lot of dishonesty. For example, if I go to Pakistan, I wear my normal clothes, my granddad would say to me, don't go in there. Because they're yeah. gonna they're gonna increase the prices. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why don't they have a fixed set of prices? Why are they changing base? It's like what Amazon got in trouble for. They tracked your spending habits on Amazon, and they would increase the prices if you if you liked certain books, because mm. then they would get more revenue out of it. That was unethical, and they got stopped for that. I shouldn't obviously. I'd be allowed to mention companies, but anyway, the purpose I'm, make, I'm making this is that like this this sort of dishonesty, this sort of like uh, it's not it's not just dishonesty, but like it's more like. Uh, like they, they, they treat you not like a human. There's low integrity. Mm. There's more like. But see, this is very interesting because this yeah. goes to the whole thing of why we see selling as negative. Because not just in the Muslim culture, even in non-Muslim culture, yeah, well. sales are seen as a negative thing. It's usually why because when you think about selling in sales, you think about a dodgy car salesman. Yeah. So you go to buy a car for a guy, yeah. he's like, it's a perfect car, this, that, and the other. You pay him the money. As soon as you drive out of there, the car <laughs> breaks down and it's like everything's gone, right? And mm -hmm. so it's that, it's like you said, it's that lack of integrity. Yeah. But if you think about, like I always tell our brothers, because you know, we work with a lot of Muslims, we're trying to tell them that, look, you have to get out there and you have to sell what you're doing. Yeah. You have to sell. Because, but I say to them, look, let's have this shift in mindset. Instead of me saying sell, <coughs> how about if I said you have to share? Yeah. Share is better, I like share. Right? All right. Share is a good word. Mm. Why is share a good word? It, it feels like more together. You feel nice about it, yeah, right? Yeah, you feel nice. But in essence, what is selling? Selling is the act of giving you something for money or value. Yeah. I mean, right? it's, it's good because you know occupations as well, jobs, they don't actually have sales. They have like in different, in different uh, industries. For example, your business development. Yeah, we that's, call it like account yeah. manager and things yeah, like that. Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. But what actually it is, is you're basically selling. Yeah. Even like banks, they have a different name for it. Mm. If you want to sell your you know, services to other businesses and yeah. stuff like that, it's a specific name. But like it's... Is that people don't like the word sell because yeah. they know that there's asymmetric information. That's right. So, for example, you you're the seller, I'm the buyer. I don't have as much information about something that you do. Yeah. So you're more likely to inf yeah, manipulate, yeah, yeah, yes. manipulate my mind yeah. uh, into buying something that I don't. I have yeah. to trust you for. Yeah. And mm. so when someone's when someone when you add selling into that, it's like oh, you know, he's trying to sell yeah. to me. He's trying to manipulate me. Like sometimes, yeah. I'll give you an example. Yeah, I, I, I was walking in uh, uh, King's Cross, and this guy came. He was really convinced in me to to donate to his charity. Yeah. I said, to, "I love your charity. I love what it's doing. It's different. I'll donate on, on my own in my own space on the internet." Because no, 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 donate now, please, donate now, donate now, donate now. I was like, it was bombarding. I tried to leave the conversation fifteen minutes. <laughs> no way. Wallahi, it took me fifteen minutes. A couple of friends walked past. Asim Quraysh walked past. Ghulam walked past. I wanted to speak to them. Fifteen minutes. I couldn't. You know, I couldn't leave the. Every time I tried, he just it was. He was. He knew how to sell. Mm. Uh, luckily, I, was, I managed to get away. <laughs> you know, but I was so put off. Mm. I was like, you know, if you really wanted me to do it, why don't you believe me that I'll go and do it? Mm. Why, why are you forcing yeah. me to, yeah. to do it right yeah. now and there and then? Yeah. But that's because they know probably through statistics that people won't go yeah. and donate. I think for, for me, like, um, sales is where I started out. So my first proper right. professional job yeah. was a sales role. Um, and it was very interesting for me because, um, you know, I thought selling was like uh, everyone else sees it in the sense that they put a script in front of you, yeah. get on the phone, say this stuff cold call, uh, yeah, cold calling that kind yeah, of stuff right but where i actually learned uh, the first company i worked for it was amazing because rather than doing into that they went into the psychology of selling yeah okay so yeah, they introduced it, yeah. me to the customer's mind right ah. and how do you take them through Again. different stages from yeah. being unaware yeah. to the point yeah. where they actually buy your product and they yeah. love your product and stuff. You're, giving, you're giving them the information that they need to make an informed decision yeah. But that's, what that's was important. what was amazing for me is that that sparked my curiosity and interest in psychology. Right. Right. And so then at that point, you know, I, I learned that stuff and I was like, this stuff is amazing. Mm. And because that was around about the time when I started changing, I was like, you know what? One day I want to use this for the benefit of Islam. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. Right. Um, but I had no idea how to do that. Mm. But I just knew one day I'm going to use this. But that's something ethical. Yeah. Because you're trying to, like I said, all comes back to adding value, isn't mm. it? And one of the ways you add value is to when you when I want to sell something to someone is that I trust that they'll make informed decisions. Yeah. But you just have to tap into that and give them the right knowledge. This is very good, yeah. So I always tell uh, clients this, right? 
uh, whether it's on the internet or anything like that, what we're trying to do is actually get a transaction. Yeah. Right? Even like with viewers, there's a transaction going on here. What's yeah. the transaction? Knowledge. What about knowledge? What's so, the transaction though? They, What's the trade? We are talking about something that they might be listening to. And yeah. they, we get the views. They get the knowledge. They get the value, yeah? They get the so value, yeah. So every time we're doing anything like this, whether it's on a website or anything like this, there's a transaction that takes place. What does the transaction require? Two parties. Okay, what else? I like that Nikar thinking. <laughs> what <laughs> <A> else? Contract. <laughs> yeah. what, does it, what does it require for me and you to actually trade? What does it require? Uh, agreement. Agreement, yeah. Uh, what's the foundation of trade? Trust. Trust, oh, trust okay. yes. Trust. trust. Yes, yes, yes. If you and I don't trust each other, yeah. the likelihood we won't the, trade. The trade will break. Right? Yeah. What is it that requires, what is it that gives us trust? Like, if you met me for the first time, how are you going to know if I'm trustworthy or not? You know what? Pers personally asked that question, yeah. it was watching your LinkedIn videos. <laughs> I got. I was like, this guy, mashallah. Like, I, at first, obviously, I saw your beard. I was like, mashallah, this guy's got, guy's got a beard. And then, like, he was making so much sense and, like, strategy and stuff and, and stuff like that. So I'm like, I, I quickly, I went on uh, our chat. I was like, have you heard of Muhammad Arshad? And Abdul Samad, you know, yeah. gave recommendations. So I trusted him as well. So I had I had that sort of authenticity there. Right. So that's how I So you I basically, you, you, looked at, you looked at what I was saying. Yeah, I right? checked you looked the at, profile You looked well. at me and you looked at what I was yeah. saying. You asked around. So there's different things that you're yeah. doing yeah. to form a conclusion of whether you're trusted. Yeah. A very right? meticulous yeah. nature. So, so this to. is what everyone does when they come to an organization website, your website for business. Right. Now, the key to this is actually identity. Hmm. Right? Yeah. yeah. If you looked into my identity and you found something that was incongruent, yeah. you would feel like, you know what, well, this is not yeah. good trust-wise. Yeah. Congruency is massive. Because you know, in, in English, we have this world, the guy's dodgy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What's dodgy about him? I don't really know, but something doesn't yeah, add up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's called incongruency. Right. Okay. right. So what organizations and businesses need to do is they need to become very congruent in their messaging. Like if I say to you, you know, we're all about amazing, beautiful brand design and stuff. Yeah. And then all of our designs are really bad and terrible. Yeah. It's not any good. It's like yeah. me saying, oh, I really love football. And you're like, which football team do you support? And I, I don't. I don't really support football teams. Yeah. yeah. He's like, but, okay, do you play football? No, not really. So how do you know? You'll be how like, do you know? you're like, I can't trust this guy when it comes to football. Yeah, yeah, of right? course. So yeah. in the same way, we are trying to build that trust. And this is what branding is about. This is what identity is about, that you actually do that foundation level. And this is why, um, you know, we used to say in Xerox, was, uh, the company used to have expensive products. If you pay peanuts, you get everything. You get monkeys. You get monkeys. Right. Yeah? If you pay yeah. peanuts, you get monkeys. Yeah. So we're in, a, we're in an age right now where you can go, for example, on the internet and hire someone to run your Facebook ads for a thousand dollars a month or something. Yep. Okay. I call them Facebook monkeys. Right? Right. <laughs> the reason I call them that is because these guys have no understanding of branding, of messaging, yep. of positioning, of identity, of trust, of transaction. They don't know none of this, right? Mm -hmm. But they'll run your ads for you. But that stuff is the foundation. And that will ruin your reputation. That will ruin, that will ruin your campaign. You won't get the yeah. optimization. They don't know what they're doing. Would you, would so, you just stop there? Would you say before the internet age, all of these qualities were something that you'd have to find within people? Because, because the face of somebody that you're interacting with was the sale. Whereas nowadays, mm. it's more about the face of the website that yes, you interact with. Yeah. Do you think that the same kind of concepts you're trying to put into the website was what you'd have to instill yeah. into people. Now it's harder exactly. then, isn't it? Yeah. Now it's harder because before it was you could be a good person and that would take you places. Now you can, you can, you know, what do you call it, like people can deceive or they can, they'll, they'll be more skeptical when they see a website, they have to build their trust a bit yeah. more harder because there's no personal interaction as well. So there's, a, there's, there's added depth. There's different challenges now. Yeah, different yeah. challenges. Yeah. But in terms of like adding this trust, I mean like, Obviously, like you need experience. Obviously, if you want to start a company and uh, you have talent, uh, you have to look at talent. You have to look at them. Are they got? Have they got the experience, qualifications, stuff like that? I mean, that's to help build you trust. Build trust, isn't it? But in terms of like trust, I mean, how do you acquire that? So trust is like you said. It's in, the, in, the de in the sense of marketing and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. So one of the things we do is that when it comes to selling, because yeah. for me, like there's three areas that I'm really interested in. One is communication as a whole. Yeah. One is selling and one is influence, okay. CSI guy, yeah? Okay. So <laughs> for me, these are the big things. Now, yeah. uh, like we were talking about earlier, sales is like a dirty word and stuff. But if I said communication, then maybe yeah. we'd see it very differently, yeah. right? Yeah, true. So for example, if I said to you, like, you have to uh, get a job in, you got a job interview, you have to get that job, and yeah. you're not allowed to communicate in the interview. You'd right? Or if I said, look, you want to marry this sister, you got to go see her dad, you're not allowed to communicate. 
Yeah, yeah, there will be no way of getting to the objective. There's no way, right? Yeah. Communication is the key mm. that facilitates yeah. it all, right? And this is why it's so amazing that if you look, when I was a kid, I used to look at the uh, miracles of the prophets, and I'll be like, uh, look at Musa alayhi salam, he's got the staff that becomes a snake. Yeah. So yeah. cool. Yeah, Isa alayhi salam, he breathes uh, into this clay bird, it becomes yeah, a real yeah. bird. Yeah. And I'm like, all these miracles are so cool. Yeah. Um, the Prophet, what did he get? He got a book. <laughs> What's that about, right? <laughs> yeah. like, they got all these cool ones, and he got a book. Yeah. But that's because the most important and powerful thing in this world is communication. Communication, mm, communication is the most powerful and the, thing. And it's yeah. pure. And it's pure. It's the words of Allah. Yeah. So if you think about that, that communication is that big. Yeah. Like the power of language is so huge. SubhanAllah. That even it's, Allah yeah, chose that. Chose that as the ever, of, that's forever. Yeah. It's, the, it's the miracle that basically lasts throughout time. Yeah. Right? And so communication is so important and it's a foundation for when you anything when you're doing uh, It's a foundation for guidance, Huda. Foundation for guidance is yeah. the foundation for like let's imagine like we said trust building is for yeah. that. What about motivating your people? What about leadership? All yeah. these kind of other skills that you need. Yeah. They're all the they're all foundation of communication. Yeah. I mean if you look at the like Prophet Sassan's life the way he communicated to different people to yeah. get them to do then to get them to be part of Islam. Yes. Like for example, there was one enemy of Islam who wanted to kill the Prophet. And he just put his hand on his chest, yeah. you know, and that was enough to change the heart of mm. this person. But that's sort of is communication, isn't it? Because yeah. Yeah. you are, you have a goal and objective, which is to get people to come to Islam. Yeah. And then you've changed your communication tactics to get them to appreciate yeah. the love of Islam. Once they're in it, they will appreciate the true beauty and, and the, the the truth that is in it. Yeah. So like I I, I can see that this has this divine principle. Yeah. Isn't it? And that's why I believe that as Muslims, communication should be something we look deeply into. And when you say it like communication, I, I, I'm much more comfortable with that. Yeah, you are. Yeah. You don't like that word sales, yeah. right? But I think yeah. it was going to take time for it to become a bit more natural, Yeah. I think. But in terms of like communication, like what kinds of, uh, as in like, what kind of advice would you give to be a good communicator? Yeah. Are you good at sales? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think uh, by the way, like if you've got any guys who are watching and they're interested in like entrepreneurship and yeah. business and yeah. this kind of stuff, like you have to master sales. Yeah. You have to master sales because at the end of the day, uh, you're consistently selling yourself. Like yeah. right now, you know, you're sitting here, you have a message that you're pushing out. Yeah. Right? You have something that you want to give. And the better your communication, the more value you're going to be able to add. That's the true. weaker your communication, the weaker your value will be. Mm. Right? So, sales, communication, influence, this is stuff that we as Muslims must master. You know, a really good point as well to add to that. I mean, like, sometimes you meet people who are really knowledgeable people. They can't communicate the ideas mm. effectively. So, they can't pass down that knowledge. But you meet people who have some knowledge, but yeah. they're very, very grounded in it. They can teach it and they can communicate it really effectively. And they get the outreach based on that. Mm. Um, so you could, you could look at it from that angle as well, yeah. that it will also enhance your ability to help others. Yeah. Even in this podcast, for me and Shaib, we should have more training and understanding mm. of how to be radio hosts. And yeah. It's a slow process, inshallah. But in that way, in return, we will be helping steer the discussions and getting benefit out of this for our listeners, yeah. which is at the end of the day to help them become better people. So like the communication has, is, is so important, it's so intertwined with everything yeah. that you can't miss it even in business. Yeah, mm. every single part of your life, communication is basically the key to it. Yeah. Uh, and one of the great things you're doing is actually doing it. So mm. the more you communicate, the better, right? Yeah. One of the reasons why I'm, I'm very fortunate is because um, I used to do counselling at a uh, organisation, Muslim Youth Helpline, yeah. and you know I was on the phone there for five years. Right. Right. So me speaking on the phone there for five years helped me in my communication. Mm. Before that, I was working at like a, a mini cab office and I was answering phones. So from the age of 17, I was working. I did that for a couple of years, and then even when I got to my sales job, I was constantly communicating. Mm. Even when I got into uh, you know the other roles that I've been in, Aira and all these kind of things, it was constant communication. And so all of this led up to your career path that you've yeah. paved out, your entrepreneurial endeavours, your helping the community, all came from communication. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, it's 15 years of just yeah. pure communication in different formats to help mm. others. Mm. So I, I can see that you're, you know, I can trust you now. I can trust you because you're giving experience and yeah. you're putting your, you know, where your money where your mouth is. Yeah. You're showing that communication does get you places. Yeah. As, and especially important for, as a Muslim, because if you want to make an impact in this ummah, yeah. you need to be good at communicating Absolutely. properly. Yeah. I mean, like for example, let's just look at uh, scholars are uh, first to go to, for examples. 
but the best the scholars are incredibly good at the Arabic language. Mm. You know, like mm. Imam Shafi'i he was a poet. You know, yeah. all of these scholars they they mastered the Arabic language, they mastered the Quran, mm. they mastered the pure basics to a very high level. And that's what made them good at communication. Yeah. That's what made them pass on the message really effectively. Yeah. You know, so I, I can not just in business, but in every realm, yeah. you can be good at communicating sincerely. And and it's, it's, it's the same thing when you come back to when you said when you came to ISOC, this is the first time that you were able to enjoy a khutbah. Mm, it's yeah. because of the communication exactly. channel yep. there. And yep. that obviously sparked something yep. within you to then start a practicing journey and etc. Mm. So that, that point of communication was key in, yeah. in that factor. And also I was going to say that um, in terms of like your mentoring and coaching, what kind of, uh, what kind of stuff do you do in that that helps uh, you know, create that mindset? of being good at communication or being a better person in general. Mm. What kind of stuff is that? So uh, I do lots of different types of coaching. I've done um, like uh, communication training, coaching. Uh, I've done uh, marriage counseling. So <laughs> don't do marriage counseling. It's horrible, <laughs> horrible, <laughs> painful. Sometimes I've sat there seven hours with people and so like, don't, do, don't do marriage counseling and stuff. But, um, and communication coaching and business consultancy coaching, sure. all that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of this is about belief. Right? right. It's about a lack of belief that people have within themselves and it's about someone else who cares enough about you to believe in you. That's the foundation to you doing that's, this mentoring. That's, that's the foundation of it, right? Okay. I believe that in order for you to have a great coach, uh, I believe anyone can be a coach. It doesn't have to be someone like me who's got 15 years experience. Sure. I believe you could coach him amazingly, right? The foundation of that is actually you caring about him. Right. Caring him about him more than you care about yourself care about in that time you're there. Yeah? <laughs> so that, that's, the, that's the first thing. The second thing is actually... actually there's a hadith in that, isn't it? Like, none of you truly believe until you love yeah. yourself or you love your brother. Exactly. I was about to quote that, so that's why yeah. I asked that. <laughs> no, no, yeah, is that why, yeah? <laughs> so one is like caring for, each, for him, right? Yeah. The second thing is actually pushing him. Pushing him. Right? right. Because remember there's a, the whole diagram where this is, uh, this is where you're comfortable yeah. and this is where growth happens. Yeah. So you need to step out of that comfort zone. So a lot of my co coaching and stuff is about pushing people sure. to a place where they don't want to go, right? Um, and then thirdly is holding them accountable to that. But the problem is when you push people, the question is how much do you push? You can't push. You because if you push them, them too much, yeah. then they like repel you, reject you. They're like, right, this guy's a loser. I don't want nothing to do with you. And they yeah. go. And yeah. the, thing, right? just, the most it? difficult aspect to that is if you push certain people the same as you push other people, it's not going to have the same effect. Yeah. One person can take a certain amount. Yeah. And that's the and hard to, thing about managing that, people. And that's where experience comes from. Yeah. Yeah. That after doing it for years, you realize, because this one, one of the biggest things that happens with coaching is people will basically try and bluff you. Yeah. Right? Okay. So people will talk to me and I'll be like, okay, sister, so tell me, why did that happen? And she'll be like, oh, it happened because she didn't submit the report in time. Why didn't she? Well, why? What happened about? Why was the report a big, big idea? Or because of this? Because, of this. and eventually it gets to the point where, oh, because the first time I met her, she didn't say salam to me. Uh, <laughs> so you see, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so yeah. if you accept that bluff the first time, yeah. then what happens is you won't get to the bottom. But yeah. how do you go further by caring about them? Sure. Because if you don't care about them enough, you yeah. won't go deeper. And it still comes down to communication as yep. well. But I'm saying if you don't, and this is what I do, yeah. and when I'm coaching people and yeah. I'm working yeah. with believe them, in them I, I believe in them that they're amazing, they're capable of amazing things because I know where I came from and what I achieved. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm not going to take their rubbish. Yeah. yeah. So they'll be like, you know, even if they, like, there's been sisters that have given me tears. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't care about the tears. Yeah, yeah. Because like, you know that. Yeah, that's because not, that's, that's not, not it. Route, you yeah. have to go further down, further right? That. And so this is something interesting. When I do, I do a lot of public speaking coaching, a lot of public speaking training. Yeah. Um, you know, you think about this fact that um, normally, if I told most people to come out here and speak in front of a camera yeah. or speak in front of a hundred people, most people would be like shocked. Yeah. I can't do it. Shocked, yeah. right? But it's crazy. Why? Because how long have you been speaking? A couple of years, maybe less than that. How long? Uh, public speaking yeah. could be, let's say, four or five years. Four or five years. What about you? I've been on and off, but I started when I was at ISOC. Okay, long. so how, how long? long? What, three so years? About three, four years. Yeah. Right, okay, three good. Years. I said to you, how long have you been speaking? <laughs> What's the answer to that question? Like, I asked you, a year old, two years old. Yeah, so how many years have you been speaking? 20, like a good 20, 20, 23, 23, 23 years. 20, 23 and most years, people yeah. that I do training for, they're coming to the stage, they have 20 years experience of doing that thing, yet when they get in front of a crowd, the experience evaporates. Mm, Why? 
because they don't mm. realize that all speaking is public speaking. Uh, yeah. And if they can just make that shift in their mind, they realize when I came up here, <coughs> you know, I can speak to my mom and dad fine. When I come in front of a crowd of 100 people, I've got the same tongue, I've got the same cheeks, the same mouth, I've got the same brain. Mm. Why is it an issue for me to communicate effectively? Right. Because you're afraid you get judged. Yeah, very good. Mm. So where's your focus? focus on the people. On the people, not on yourself. No. Where's your focus? If you're worried you're going to get judged, where's your focus? Yeah. As in, in yourself, making yeah. a mistake. You're focused on your. You're caring about yourself in that moment. Mm. You're too focused okay. on. Ne- you're focused that. on yourself, right? Rather than you focusing on your audience. Right. You're focused on yourself. Yeah. How am I gonna feel? Yeah. How am I gonna look? It's like yeah. it's like this now. Like I, I always do. That. I do this in the in in this uh, training that I do. I get them to stand up and I say, right, everyone look at his face because people don't like yeah. a group of a hundred people yeah. or whatever looking at their face. <laughs> so I'm like, everyone look at their face, and the guy's getting really uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And after that, I'm like, everyone look at my belly. <laughs> right, everyone looks at my belly And I'm like, look, if I stand here And I start thinking, oh my god, they're looking at my belly He's probably thinking, how big is that belly? How did it get so big? I hope mine don't get that big And I hope for my wife, what would my wife say If my belly got that big? I said, if I stand here and I start thinking about my defects And my issues, yeah. then my focus is all wrong yeah. And this is why I've been able to shift it Because, you know, when I, when I was part of the team That originally started Al Maghrib in the UK yeah. um, And when we were sitting there For Al Maghrib Institute, there's like four or five brothers in the room and we were giving out different roles. And they said to me, you're going to be the Amir for London. Okay. And I was like, okay, you know what? I love event management. I'm a project manager. This is me, yeah? I'm doing it. And then he said, you're going to do public speaking. And I was like, okay, listen. Said, <laughs> the pitch, like I'm good at organizing no, like, things? Yeah, when you, exactly. Yeah. So I was like, I said, listen, I will do everything for that role except, except the public speaking. speaking. So look how times have changed. Yeah. It? yeah. And so at that point, he said to me, no, you have to do public speaking, right? So me, I hate public speaking because at, at uni... What I did is we had a group exercise. Everyone in the group had to public speak. And oh. what I did is I did the work for everyone. I was like, I'll do most ah, of the work okay. so I don't need to speak. Because sure. I was terrified of public speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then when I got to the day, I just said, uh, hi, my name is Mohammed Ashad. And then I, they just moved on. I didn't have to do no speaking on the day. So that's how I was about speaking. So when we got to Al-Maghrib, like the, this is the opening of Al-Maghrib because it was starting and I did the yeah. open ceremony type of thing. Mm. I was so nervous. Like, leading up to it, I was starting to feel physically in pain. So yeah. you know, if, you, if you've had a phobia of speaking like I did, yeah. I was started feeling like sick and sick and sick. Yeah. And when I got there, I was ha- asking brothers, like, give me some advice. Like, you know when you're in trouble, you're asking yeah, yeah, advice. Yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. they were all making fun of me. They were like, just, just start by saying, welcome to Al Maghrib. Just yeah, start like, yeah, yeah. like crazy <laughs> stuff. And I was like feeling really bad. And so yeah. the, anyway, the first time I, I, I spoke in front of the audience, I wrote everything out word for word and I spoke. And after it, I was so relieved. That was that over. It was over. Yeah. And then what happened, I realised, oh my God, you know what? In about eight weeks, there's another seminar. <laughs> yeah. And then I started feeling worse and worse. And yeah. I, I got married at that time. I started telling my wife, she was like, Look, why are you complaining about it? I'm like, it, it feels terrible. Yeah. And every time I kept going through that, I was going through the pain myself. Mm. And then there came a day and I said to myself, you know what? This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. I'm like, listen, you've got a simple choice. I talked to myself, I said, you've got a simple choice. Either you want to do the Amir role, and you accept the responsibilities and the things that come with it, or you don't and you walk away. Mm. It's a very simple decision. You know, also as well, like, um, you know, people that lead Salah, yeah. they often have the same issues. What, but what helped me understand is that, you know, when you, if you were to lead the Salah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is listening to you reading the Quran in the first place. And he is the main audience here, mm. not doing it for the sake of the people. Mm. Yeah. And that actually helped me in public speaking as well. Because exactly. when, I, when I thought of that, I thought, okay, if I lead the salah, if I don't yes. lead the salah, it doesn't matter. Because especially in ISOC prayer rooms, yeah, you just get forced sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't really <laughs> want to read. Yeah. So you just naturally have that expectation that there is a possibility you just get forced to read. And you think in the back of your head, look, if I read, that's it. I'm just going to read. I'm not going to care about the audience. I really don't care. Mm. I just want to focus on getting it right. So Allah is going to listen to me. Yeah. And that mindset, I, mean, I can see that. For example, like you just said to yourself, like, what's the point? Yep. Like, what's the point? I was like, basically, it was, it was one decision at the end of my life yeah. because I went... You know what? I am going to do this and I want to do this, inshallah, right? And as soon as I made that decision, everything became oh, easier. Yeah. yeah. It became so easy. And now I'm going out to people, telling them about communication. I'm teaching people about communication. I'm coaching. SubhanAllah. It's crazy. Yeah. You've gone it's from crazy. There I'm going full to circle consulting to the point where I love people communication. It's just the thought, just the thought yeah. and the idea that stemmed. And it was one decision. And this, this is what I'm saying that people that are watching this, they need to realize that you might not have the answer of how you're going to do it, what you're going to do. But it's about believing that you are capable and of doing this. And it's just a decision away. I mean, some One people decision, talk yeah. about this as well, like 15 seconds it takes, or 
three yeah. three nods to, to make yeah. a change like now can i fix it and then you can change your mindset like that yeah. subhanallah it's just like mm. but people often yeah. think there's barriers there's years and no it's not years you can do it's something one decision like that. it's one decision mm. and then seeing that through okay so and so these are some of the kind of things that when you're mentoring you yeah. and, and still into people. i think we're going to end soon inshallah but yeah. i want to talk about one aspect in terms of belief i think like a lot of muslims young muslims you know uh, I, I know there's we often complain a lot so we have and, and the older generations like oh you have everything you have everything at your disposal education but they don't understand the kind of pains that we feel the overflow of information the peer pressure the financial situations that we're in yeah. the mm. you know all these aspects are being enforced and pressurizing us um, and so we kind of lose our sense of belief because we lose our sense we our, our, like our true self we don't really nurture it mm. we're too busy focused on how we are perceived by other people yeah. and how we'll be perceived if we do xyz business choices like that so these all bog us down to then take mediocrity as our sort of mm. outcome but what advice would you give to make sure that we can get that belief and not to have that self-doubt mm. to make the best decisions not just in entrepreneurship but just making sure that we become the best we can be yeah so i think that imagine if there was a course that was being sold out there which said come to this course and we will make you great okay there will be people that will go to that course. Let's say someone like Tony Robbins, right? Okay. Tony Robbins is very famous. He'll say, come to my course and I'll make you great. You'll be better than when you came here. Yeah. There's millions of people around the world who have been impacted by Tony Robbins. Yeah. And they've actually done that, right? What if you had a course from Allah that mm. made you amazing, mm. right? And if you look at it, Islam is exactly that. That's yeah. what Islam is, right? It's about yeah. taking the people who were the lowest of the low, the Arabs, yeah. who no one wanted to conquer, and making them one of the greatest people ever that lived. Yeah. It's about taking individuals who are burying their daughters alive yeah. to become the best of all humanity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So Islam, this is why Muslim mastery is so important to me, because I feel like Islam has all the answers for us to be the greatest people that ever lived. To master the spiritual yeah. aspect, to master the belief. Every part of it, whether it's business, whether yeah. it's uh, communication, family, whatever it is, like every part of it is within Islam. Like mm. this, is what I'm saying that what should happen is that you should fall in love with Islam. Allah, Allah like Allah literally Allah. every part of it. So, yeah. for example, I should know that anything that Allah's made halal for me is actually like amazing, mm. and I'm so lucky that this is halal. And anything that's haram for me is amazing because it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna help Allah, me in another yeah. way. It's like this whole thing where the morning miracle. There's a book called The Morning Miracle. Okay. Billionaires they all wake up early in the morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like we have Fajr, we can wake <laughs> up. All, all yeah. the things. Like if someone just followed Islam, like like it should be followed. Team, and I'm talking yeah. about the base level of following yeah. it. They will be great, right? And so you need to realize that as Muslims, yeah, you have exactly what you need to be at that level. Subhanallah. You know when you mentioned that I was teaching a class yesterday, and in this hadith that I was reading, I had the explanation. The hadith is khairukum uh, man ta'alam al the best of you are those who learn the Qur'an and teach it. Yeah. And the commentary on that was from the Shaykh was saying that people saying the best, the best of you, what that means is not just the best of you in Akhirah, the best mm. of you in dunya, yeah. you'll be leaders. Mm. You mentioned you'll be, you'll be the best of people who learn the Qur'an and internalize it, act yeah. upon it, acting as well. Mm. You may know a little bit of Qur'an, but you act upon that. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. you just said over this, it will yeah. make you a leader. Yes. It will make you achieve great things yeah. because it's the, this, is the, this is the kalam of Allah. Yeah. And that is the best curriculum, isn't it? Yeah. Especially at the start of learning. Mm. Yeah. So, like, and I mean, that's so. So, I want to give you some because a lot of the stuff we've talked about is like abstract and it's yeah, yeah. like kind General. of thing. And and I, yeah. I I think it's important to do that because sometimes you trip over the truth, right? Yeah. And you realize things, but it's all about practicalities as well. Yeah? yeah. So I want to share some very quick things with you that someone can actually take away yeah. and use good. that to benefit themselves, Definitely. right? So the first thing I would say is that you know there's a massive thing out there which is like uh, you know you are what you eat. So you eat healthy food, you're going to be healthy, yeah. right? And I think what we don't do enough of is think about our mindset. Okay. Because the truth is, you are what you consume, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. okay, so check this out now. So what happens is that most people, when they wake up, what's the first thing they will do? Check the, phone. the, phone. check the phones. The, uh, <laughs> Very good. They check their phones, yeah, right? Yeah. This is the default. I'm not going to ask you if you guys do it or not, right? Today I didn't but, do it because I watched a video and I not Okay, good. Website, so. <laughs> so this is the this is the default yeah. of of what we do, right? Yeah. Now what happens normally is sometimes you you're there and you've woken up and you'll see an email from someone giving you bad news, 
yeah. or you'll see a message from someone that's rude. Or the, so what's happening is the second you wake up in the morning, you you're being controlled by some negative force there. Is rude. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So the first thing I would say, and this is something I started a few years ago, is that I said to myself, you know what? I will not start with my phone. Okay. I will not start with my phone. Because the whole thing around doubts and negativity, whatever you put in here, that's what it's going to be. So if you're having doubts and you're having this and that, it's because you're not putting the right stuff mm. in. Right? So with phones, what I've made a rule for myself now is that I do not look at my phone until I've put Quran in my head or Fajr in my head or okay. Wudu in my head. I have a process that these are the things I must do before Friendly. I'm allowed to look at my phone. My right. brain knows that now. There's no more nafs in it. It's done. Okay. Mm -hmm. Rewind your brain. Rewind. Rewind. To, the to, only okay. exception is if I know I've got a very busy day, I'll open my calendar app just to see if I've got any early morning meetings and stuff, yeah. especially as Fajr's getting later and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Other than that, I know I'm not checking my phone at all. So right. Okay. Okay. So okay. how do I start my day then? My yeah. day starts with Allah, it starts with wudu and fajr like most people, yeah. but it doesn't have that phone element in there. Right. right? So I'm saying imagine you actually started your existence every day with Allah. Like really yeah. with Allah because, as opposed to WhatsApp. Because we know when you sleep it's like it's, it's a form of death. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So yeah. when you wake up yes. you should start up with right. So you start fresh mm. and the first thing you jump onto is WhatsApp. <laughs> or email right so this is a huge habit one habit inshallah it'll change your life that you start your day with Allah you start it with Quran you start and it can be one ayah right yeah. one ayah of Someone Quran you start with Fajr you start with Wudu you start with morning Adhkar done. Morning Adhkar your morning is, is done that is, yeah. that's the solid one. morning is done yeah. right remember we said the power of language so yeah. Adhkar Dua so language, Quran, language. All language yeah? So you start with this stuff This is something practical yeah. That you can do Even right? Salah When you're reading You're reading a language to Allah yeah. You're reading to Allah Exactly yeah. And dua You know even if you look at The duas of the Prophet And stuff yeah. Amazing Like if you sit yeah. And you look at what the duas mean, mean Like yeah. you know the dua About Allah my knee As'aluka ilma nafiya Wa rizqan tayyiba Wa amala mutakabla Like it's an amazing yeah. dua Why? <laughs> because Allah my knee As'aluka ilma nafiya Knowledge that benefits me Yeah Right? A risk which is hal uh, yeah. halal and tayyib, yeah. right? And then deeds which are accepted. Yeah. It's like that's like a triple everything whammy, that's yeah. like a triple threat, like that's amazing. Like everything you want, everything in your day. you want, and, and, your day. and the public so, to make the dua for uh, a further time. I'm not going to pray yes. just for that dua. So, my, my thing is, yeah. why wouldn't you say that dua every morning? SubhanAllah. Right? And then, me, if we're saying communications, everything, why would you not say the dua of Musa every day? Yeah, exactly. Like I know my whole day yeah. I'm speaking, so for me that's a stick. So I'm saying this routine in the morning it will transform your day. That's the first practical thing, right? Second thing is that when I first started practicing, for me like uh, music was a massive thing. Yeah, right. Music was massive. Uh, I said I'll do everything. I'll start praying. I'll stop doing all the sins, and I'll just do everything except music. I'm not gonna give that up. Yeah, <laughs> not gonna give it up at all. That was yeah. my that was my mindset, right? I had very similar. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm that guy who's like you know spent half an hour downloading one song. Like <laughs> you, you youngsters us. now yeah, who like get a song <laughs> on whatever you do, it's right? A bit harder a second. Now. You just stream it now. Yeah, stream it. Yeah. stream it, right? And yeah, so what happened with me though? Alhamdulillah, Allah helped me that when you want to give up something bad, you have to replace it. Yeah. Right. Replace so one trick to actually giving up bad things is just do more good. Forget about the bad. You're doing right, the bad yeah. things. Keep doing the more good. Piling up the good. And yeah. the good It'll will pile up and the filter out the bad. Yeah. So what yes. happened with me is I replaced it. Yeah. What I did is for five years I was, I was going to work. It took me 45 minutes to work. And every morning in those days I would listen to Islamic stuff on the way going to work. Yeah. And on the way back I'd listen to business professional audiobooks. So okay. 90 minutes so a day, five days, for five, 450 minutes a week of just pure education. Pure content for five, for five, yeah. five years. Right, wow. and that that reframed my mind. Where it, took, it got to a point where I didn't like music anymore. I wanted to listen to the content because I was that, feeling yeah, growth and I was yeah, feeling development. Yeah, right, yeah. and so I'm saying that this is something that uh, everyone watching can do. Is if you take one practical habit, one of the ways to master your habits is you attach the habit to something. Right. Okay. Right. So if like we had one brother, his name is Jamal, amazing brother. Every time we would pray in the prayer room in Ayera, he would do press ups. I'm okay. like, what are you doing? Yeah. And he just anchored it that every time I pray a salah, I will do a press up or I'll do press ups. Yeah. So, him doing that, it became a habit for him. Oh, so, that. for you, if you know you're going to drive to somewhere, you can just say, like, you know what, this is going to be the time when I listen to Quran. Yeah. And so, you attach your habits yeah. onto different things that yeah. you naturally do in your like life. For example, on the train reading Quran. Yeah. yeah. On the train yeah, reading Quran. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There, was, there was a situation where I, was, uh, I wanted to read more Quran in my life. And I didn't know like how I could do it. Yeah. So I said to myself, what is something I can change in my environment? So what I realized is that, what do you do every night before you go to bed? Uh, well, I try to do Adhkar and okay. Quran. 
But what about non-religious stuff like? Oh, I tried to read a book on logic. Okay. Yeah. What does every human being doing every night before they go to sleep? Check the phone. Brush your teeth. What do they do with their phone? Uh, social media. No. Nope. I check, put the alarms on. Yeah. Alarms. Yeah. And more importantly, I put it on charge. Charge. charge right. Yeah, yeah. Everyone puts their phone on charge, right? Yeah. So what I did is I basically went to the place next to my bed. I have a table, and there I, is my phone charger. So what I did is I got almost half. And I put it there. Uh -huh. Where the charger was. Where the charger is. Where my phone goes every yeah. night. So then what happened is at night time when the day's done, I'm finished now, I have to pick up the uh, Quran the, yeah. to, to put the my phone there. And when uh, I'm picking it up, I've got a decision now that look, the Quran's here. Do I want a relationship <laughs> with Allah? Yeah. How long is it going to take me to read a page? Maybe, I don't know, 60, 90 seconds? Okay, do you want this? And I'm like, well, I'm here. And, I might yeah, as well. I, I do. Yeah. And uh, that was it. Wow. That was that was it. And it Just by tweaking the environment, and this is what influence yeah. is about. Influence Allah is about Allah. the emotional side. It's about the rational side, but also the environment. And that's why, if you take a human being who doesn't pray and put him in Makkah, what happens? He'll pray. He starts praying, right? Yeah. Because the environment has a massive impact. And there's a story I'll tell you a quick before we end, inshallah. And environment and this environment is really important. Uh, there was a Somali brother that was driving me once to a class, and he said uh, he told me that uh, his friends were drug dealers, mm. and. Uh, what he'd do is, he realized he wanted to help them, so they'd play football. Uh, and he would purposely choose the football time, the timings for it, that would go with Maghrib Salah. So the drug dealers that were Muslim, they just started to pray Salah because it was there. They eventually started to pray Salah five times a day, mm. and then they ended up leaving the drugs. Allah mm. Allah. Because of one simple thing. And mm. I was thinking, this guy, you're a genius. Mm. That is what you call That's like someone who says, look, I, I'm not, I, I haven't got the world in my hands. Yeah. Mm. But I know if I just do a small little thing here, yeah. cheeky little thing, yeah. it might lead to something great. And this is why in Islam we have this wonderful concept that Allah loves those deeds that are done most regularly. Mm. Small and consistent, right? yeah. And, and in terms of our growth, like you know, people watching, they might be in a position where they know they want to get there, but they're right here right now. Yeah. And so they're like, how on earth am I ever going to get they there? They feel like they're going to have to yeah. make huge, massive yeah. steps to So what do they do? There. What do they do? They take their belief and they lower it. Or their achievement, yeah. and they go instead of me getting there, yeah. like, I'm gonna go there. here, yeah. right? And I'm saying you don't need to do that. Mm -mm. What you need to do is you need to raise even higher, yeah. and then you need to believe that you can do it, and you need to go and find a way to do it. Right. Because anything, this is the beauty of the world now. Anything you want to find out, you're one click away. You're someone who mm -hmm. smokes. You want to quit smoking? How to quit smoking, <laughs> right? You're someone who wants to uh, be great at public speaking. How to be great at public speaking? Mm. Like any topic, anyone needs to do. You go, you watch TED Talks, which are good quality. You go onto YouTube, you watch podcasts. Like, you can master any area of your life in terms of content. And then the second part is going out there and doing it. Yeah, like, I, if I, I started managing people, like, all those years ago, if I didn't continue to manage people, it wouldn't be great. Yeah. Right? So you need to go and do the action. So one is you need to get your mind right about the level that you can achieve. Then do the action. And then be consistent in it. Because when you work in Muslim organizations... There's all kinds of issues that happen. People have this utopic kind of yeah. mindset about Muslim organization. I'm going to go into the Muslim uh, organization. All the brothers are going to be friendly with each other. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum, yeah, brother. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum, sister. And everything's fine. <laughs> but when they get there, there's backstabbing, there's politics, yeah. there's all this. And then they're like, yeah. you know what? I can't work here. I'm not going to work yeah. here anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's like, no, this is the part of it. This is the real test of it, exactly. right? So you just got to continue, continue, continue. Like you imagine if I had stopped speaking at Al Maghri when I first started. My life would yeah. be completely exactly. against communication, have... right? So we don't let these fears stop us. Mm. When fear happens, you go and there you hit a, it on the head. A, it, Subhanallah, yeah. there's a quote on this. Uh, a grammarian, I can't remember, one of the greatest grammarians to have existed in Arabic. Uh, he, he wanted to Sibway. master... I think, no, I, th I think no. it wasn't in Mosul Wave. I'm okay. wrong. There's a book on value of time uh, by Sheikh Abdul Fatah Ali Ghudda. It talks about this. And he, this man wanted to learn about grammar. So he spent 70,000 dirhams. I don't know how much that is now. Oh just to acquire it, and he That's became a, a master right? <laughs> yeah. he became a master right? so he said, yeah. look, I've got a goal, and he, and he used his money to, to master something, he spent it in the way of Allah to learn it, and he became, he eventually became, and he was someone who wasn't very good, he said, at the start of it, he was just quoting it, he said, I wasn't very good at it, it a bit like how you're saying it, I wasn't mm. very good at it, but I persisted, and I yeah. spent, mm. and I tried yeah. to learn it, and I became a master Because, right? why? Persistence overcomes resistance. Mm. It doesn't matter what resistance you face, yeah. Yeah. as long as you keep going, you keep doing, you keep getting the knowledge, you learn from your mistakes, it's and fine, you think right? that's, that's the beauty uh, in, in all of it Because you could have been somebody that from the beginning you were a great public speaker yeah. And you could have done lots of 15 years of public speaking And in the end you still may not have been able to mentor somebody on public mm. speaking 
because yeah. the beauty exactly. of it was in the challenge of you yes. persisting yeah. and then being able to come out and be like, wow, this is everything I learned. Yes. Now I know how to master it yeah. rather than being somebody who's already so good at it yeah. because you wouldn't realize that this is the way you have to do it. You just take it for granted. Yeah. SubhanAllah. I think that's a beautiful way to end, you know, that aspect of belief. And I hope, I hope you all benefited, inshallah. Ta'ala. inshallah. I, just want, I just want to say one more thing yeah, yeah, sure. for you, right? Um, is this that... You know, uh, when I was growing up, I think I'm probably a little bit older than you guys, right? It's a little bit, yeah. Or <laughs> right, maybe a decade or so. Yeah. <laughs> when I was growing up, like a lot of the guys I saw, um, they were they were like good, strong guys in the Islamic field who were doing work, yeah. right? Uh, the ISOC guys and all these guys, they were okay. They were just kind of starting out, right? you got to remember, this is a world where there isn't much, uh, there's no like real internet. We used to get happy if we saw like a brown person on TV and, and things like <laughs> this kind of thing, yeah? Like all this kind of stuff. But what I've got to say in the last 10 years, what I've been really, really amazed at is the quality of our youth. Mm. The quality of our youth now okay. uh, is amazing, mashallah. Okay. And this is something that gets me like really excited because a lot of the guys I've mentored and worked with, like a lot of people will know who they are, right? But the great thing about those guys is that they got me excited because of my regret. So I was like, I had to get to the age of 22, 23 before I started yeah. doing any sort of volunteering, right? Sure. And then it was like, oh my God, I'm so behind, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And then I saw these guys who were coming into Aira and Al Maghrib when I was starting, you know, these guys were volunteering. They were like 18, 19 years old. And they, and, only had... And, and they had experience already volunteering yeah. and they were, they, were, they were confident, they were yeah. this. And all they needed was me to believe in them more and yeah. raise their standards. Say, no, you think you should be there. No, no, you should be here, right? Yeah. One of the guys I was telling him, I was like, you have to come out with the first. Don't come out with anything except the first. He hadn't even thought about first, mm. right? So for me, like, when I used to see these guys who were 19, 20, 21, I would get so amazed. I'd be like, mm. look at these guys. They're like so young the thing is, you're looking, and they're so you're doing amazing. That. You're doing that. We're doing that with young people as yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know what? This is great. Yeah. This is amazing because it gives me hope for the ummah. Like there's a turnaround in yeah. the Ummah, right? Yeah. If you go back 20, Revival. 30 years ago yeah. and you look at youngsters who were like 18, 19, 20, yeah. they didn't know nothing about Islam, never mind like doing anything for Islam, yeah. right? So what I want to say is that it's it's so amazing of what's possible. And you guys know uh, the story already of uh, Umar Adilan when he's in a room and they're like, okay, he goes to everyone, make a wish. Oh, yes, yes, yeah? yes. He's like, make a wish. And yeah. one of the guys like, I wish I had lots of gold. Why? So yeah. I could give for the sake of Allah, right? And another one, he goes, okay, I wish I had gold and pearls so I could give for the sake of Allah and I would give for the kind of stuff. And Umar radiallahu anh said, I wish that this room was filled with people like Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Musab ibn Umair. Yeah. Why? Because he valued people over anything, anything else, else. right? And I'm saying like, the reason I'm here is actually for the people that are watching, yeah. for them to realize what they are. Because most of the time, people don't realize what they are. Sahaja. And I'm saying that you as Muslims, you're amazing. And you can achieve amazing things. You have the tools, you have everything you need. You just need to raise your standard, have that vision of yourself getting there. And you can get there because you're in an environment now where there's people like you yeah. who are doing amazing work. And this is the kind of vision that we should be setting for all of us, inshallah. Last thing, just before the shout out, uh, is there like some top, uh, things that you'd refer people to after this episode, certain websites or books that come to your mind yeah, yeah, sure. uh, after people have seen yeah. this. That they so can go to. Um, there's lots of different books. Like uh, I read so many books. One of the things I'd say to people is uh, things like Audible, where you can consume content while you're yeah. on the thing. You were talking about Blinklist and Blinklist other things like good. that. My, my which is fellow Amir just gave me that. Yeah, that's see. an amazing kind of resource yeah. and stuff. I'm saying uh, for communication, there's a really good book called Made to Stick, Made to Stick. which is by Chip Heath and Dan Heath. It's all about Chip how you actually do. Uh, like uh, information which sticks with people. Like there's certain things I've said to you today, if I come back to you in a year and I say this story about Pakistan, yeah. in a year you'll remember it. Yeah. yeah. And that's because <laughs> I've designed it like that and there's a formula to doing that, right? Okay. So one is made to stick. The other thing is another book by Chip Heath and Dan Heath is called Switch, How to Change When Things Are Hard. Okay. So if you want to change your life, you want to change different parts of it, it goes through the psychology of influence, how you kind of change your things. If you're interested in sales, like you should be, Sell or Be Sold is another good book and stuff. Okay. So Sell there's loads sold. of like resources sure. out there. Uh, and if anyone wants to get in touch with me, they can contact us at info at muslimmastery.com. And uh, okay. inshallah, I'll be happy to give uh, recommendations. And, and that's, that's uh, Muslim Mastery is both for like kind of personal development and business uh, development. Yeah. I mean, with businesses, my company's called Life Digital. Okay, yeah. So it's lifedigital.co, just C-O. And they can contact us on there. Um, but, you know, 
in shallah i'm here for you guys that's the end of the episode um so for the people out there alhamdulillah inshallah you guys enjoyed uh, all of that uh, just to remind everyone that ibn batuta's boat is on all of the social medias so it's just at ibn batuta's boat on your instagram your facebook your twitter um and also, uh, if you guys are watching this uh, visually, or actually if you're listening to the SoundCloud, then we also have a visual. And if you guys are watching this visually uh, on YouTube, we do have a SoundCloud. So on both platforms, inshallah. Um, so please do check them out. And also our website is where you can find everything, the content for everything that we have, yeah. is uh, ibnbatutasboat.com. Also, check out our social media. We've just recently uh, created the volunteering forms oh, yes. uh, and volunt voluntary vacancies as well. Uh, one of the topics that he's mentioned was talent, you know, or part of it is bringing good people in. And we need good people. We need people like yourselves who are invested in what we want to achieve and can see that maybe you have a particular skill in analytics or maybe you have a particular skill that we haven't got maybe in finance. You feel like you can bring those skills and be part of this change, be part of this movement and help the ummah, especially the young people, uh, our future, inshallah. Jazakum khair. Please do contact us if that's something that interests you. Jazakum khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, I told I told, I told I'm going to be late. Sorry, How long man. Will it take uh, you to get there? This is why you have to control me. I talk too much, man. No, it was, it was How long?